Hello and welcome to At The Letters. Ben Nicholson-Smith here with you. Arden Zwelling alongside me and the show is produced by Christian Ryan and Nick Andrade. Thanks for being with us today on Wednesday, May 24th. And Arden, like, I don't know where to start because, you know, going into this show as we're kind of preparing for it, you kind of think, this has been bad. This has not been a good week for the Blue Jays. They are losing games to division rivals. They are making mistakes mentally, uh, you know, physically, fundamentally. They are not playing their best baseball. And then they go out on Tuesday and they beat the best team in baseball by a score of 20 to 1. So I I honestly don't know where to begin um, other than to say this has been quite a week for the Jays. I, I hate games like that, the 20 to 1 game, because it throws everything off. It makes it yeah. impossible to look at here's what the Jays have done over the last week, or you know, here's their runners in scoring position, or here's what Tampa Bay's run differential on the season is, right? Like that's how impactful that uh, lopsided score was that knocked the Rays out of the MLB lead in run differential. Uh, and the thing is, like Tampa Bay just essentially forfeited that game from the eighth inning on and you know if it was up to me MLB would have a mercy rule like international baseball does so that situations like that don't arise and so that people like me don't have to figure out how to remove 10 garbage time runs of like BP pitching over the la- the last uh, two innings of the game uh, but that is one of many many things that uh, you know I-, I feel should happen that never will. Well, it is like, even from like a, a bookkeeping standpoint, it gets pretty confusing, right? Because you have Luke Rayley in there giving up bombs. And it's like, to, to me, it's, you know, it's reminiscent of an empty net goal in hockey or something along those lines, where it's just a different set of circumstances. Like maybe it's like, you know, the fourth quarter in a basketball game where one team's up 25 points and you just have these garbage time points. So at the same time, it counts. Obviously, you want to, to pile on you, if you if you're on the field and this kind of goes to some of the stuff we said last week about um, the Yankees and, and Aaron judge versus Jay Jackson, it's still major league baseball. You still have to compete within that set of rules, but man, 20 to one, this is, it, it's still certainly contains some positives for a blue Jays offense that was really searching for some results for a long time there. Yeah. Luke really needs a secondary pitch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's going to need to mix it up. You can't just uh, pump in the uh, what, like the 60 mile per hour. I, I guess it was probably classified as an EFIS uh, that he was. They're, they're going to want to get him working on uh, something to get hitters off of that thing. But you're right. Like if, if you're the Blue Jays, you have to go up and compete. This is the highest level in the world. If the Rays are going to make a mockery of it as the Blue Jays, you got to go up and do what you do and take advantage of the situations that you're in. There's no friends at this level. The stats can count for like the even the guys like an Ernie Clement who comes up with a hit like that's a hit on his baseball reference page and nobody's going to ask about the context of that hit when his career is said and done for the Blue Jays players who are batting who are going to be going to arbitration uh you know or, or at least like going through that potentially going through that process Vladimir Guerrero Jr that grand slam that matters like those ribbies that hit that home run those points of ops that could be dollars and cents to him so he absolutely has to go up there and do what he did against that pitching for sure and it's a good sign for the blue jays we'll get into vlad jr george springer some of these hitters who are trying to find some better results uh, overall it's been a very disappointing uh, month offensively for the blue jays um, so we'll get into that touch on some some pitching as well here in the course of the episode but you know, as we look at this team, big picture, Arden, like they're 26 and 23 through 49 games. So they still have a lot of time left. Obviously, they still have 113 games left. But, you know, I look at some of the numbers and if they want to win 95 games, which you got to think the way the Rays are playing, that's the bare minimum to consider uh, to have a chance at winning the American League East. They're going to have to play at a 99 win pace from this point on. Um, they are going to have to play at a pace that few teams match uh, for the remaining 113 games of the season. And that's to get to 95 games, which as recently as a couple weeks ago, that was their pace. That's where they were going. And then you get swept by the Orioles. You lose the first one against the, the Rays. You lose three or four against the Yankees. None of these losses in and of themselves, as frustrating as they are, none of these losses 
totally undo the Blue Jays' chances. And I still think they're a playoff team. I still think they're going to be in October with a chance to make noise. But at the same time, you look at the big picture of where they are right now, it's kind of getting to a point that it's going to be tougher for them to get one of those first-round buys. It's so funny that you went there because I was like, no, it's too early to say something like this. But I'm honestly not even considering the division title as being a play <laughs> anymore. Really? Honestly, with how wow. with the way this division is going, with how well the Rays have played, if the Rays go 500 the rest of the season, they're still going to win over 90 games, yeah. right? Um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I imagine if they went 500 the rest of the way, they'd probably win like 92 or something like that. Yeah. Do you have it in front of you? No, but they're they're twenty games over, so that would be ninety one and seventy one. Yeah, they are perfect. So they would win ninety one. So are the Rays going to go five hundred the rest of the way? They're probably going to play better than five hundred the rest of the way. So you got to think of the Rays as at least a mid nineties win team. So if you're the Blue Jays, you have to play that much better to surpass the Rays. But oh, by the way, it's not like you're in second place in this division. There's three other teams ahead of you and i mean i don't believe that the red Sox are going to be there at the end um the orioles i don't know if your opinion on this has changed because remember last year and you were very right to say this that when the orioles were playing above their heads last year you thought they were going to come back down to earth and they very much did they look a lot better this year to me than they were last year be interesting to see what they do at the trade deadline i think the yankees are going to be there absolutely at the end of the year so when i just look at the the market conditions in the american league east and just how dramatically this, uh, you know, just how competitive this comp- this this division has been. I just think the Blue Jays are essentially, as much as I hate to say this to fans who still have like <laughs> 112 games remaining to, to watch, uh, you're essentially playing the rest of your season to secure home field advantage in a wild card series because I think that's where the Blue Jays are heading, uh, you know, two coin flips and possibly three at the end of September. Wow. Yeah, I mean that you make a reasonable case. And I, I want to touch on some of the <clears throat> some of the points about the division, including getting back to the Orioles, because they're such an interesting team. Um, but you know, with respect to the Blue Jays and the Rays, I think the chances are slim. And I, I think that the Rays obviously are the favorite to emerge out of this division as the as the division winner. They're playing so well offensively. They have guys taking legit steps forward, like a Yandy Diaz, a Wander Franco. This is not like, you know, I look at the Texas Rangers, and it's like everything is going perfectly for the Texas Rangers. And they're probably going to come back to earth. Doesn't mean they won't make the playoffs, but they're probably coming back down to earth. The Rays, it's not like everything's going right for them. They've lost Springs and Rasmussen. Glasnow's not pitched. You know, he's coming back. This is not a team where it's like they're, this is their dream outcome. This is like one of the outcomes that's pretty good, and they're making it work. So all of that to say, I think that they're really scary. I think that they have to be considered the favorites, but the Jays could play at a 99-win pace for the rest of the season. I think it's a reach, and I, I think it would have sounded like even more of a reach before they won 20-1 to 1, uh, on Tuesday. I think it's possible, and I think it's possible that the Rays play at an 84-win pace for the rest of the season, and in that scenario, boom, the Blue Jays can win the division. So I I think they have to proceed, of course, as though the division's in play, and I can see it happening. It's not like this remote, remote chance, but they're not the favorites. It's possible, but it's unlikely. And part of what makes it unlikely is the lack of head-to-head competition yeah. with the Rays and Yankees over the rest of the year. Like After this Rays uh, series is up, the Blue Jays aren't going to play the Rays and Yankees. We should say it's Wednesday morning right now, so the Blue Jays are two games into this Rays series. We've got two more to go. After this series is up, the Blue Jays aren't going to play the, the Rays and the Yankees again until September. And there's going to be a stretch in September where they play exclusively the Rays and Yankees. And if the Blue Jays are hot as hell on that stretch and the Rays are slumping and the Yankees have a million injuries and you get some luck going your way in one-run games, maybe the Blue Jays can make hay and do great things in that stretch. Or maybe the Rays and Yankees are going to be good teams and those are going to be competitive games just like we've seen between the Blue Jays and the Yankees and Blue Jays and Rays to this point. And it probably ends up looking like kind of 500 ball. <laughs> and the Blue Jays aren't able to make up that ground because they're playing really good competition. If you're the Blue Jays, you're relying so much on other 
teams with a more balanced schedule to do the damage to the teams ahead of you. You have less opportunity to do that direct damage. That's why this stretch recently against division opponents in which, so since the Blue Jays swept the Braves, they played Yankees, Orioles, Rays. They've gone two and seven to this point. Uh, on the season, the Blue Jays have a 316 win percentage in their division. Ooh. That's been so damaging. Like that, that is really, really hurt them and their chances of winning this division in a really meaningful way. Like it's interesting. You look back at it, like the teams with the worst interdivision records that have reached the postseason had records that were like 450. 460 the blue jays are at 316 you know like and look those those winners though or those teams that went to the postseason that played really poorly in their division that was in a era a time when you played your division rivals a lot more so it's not a perfect comparison but still the blue jays have played well well below the standard against teams in their division than they're going that they're going to need to to be successful they, they got to step it up for sure and you know as much as there's less interdivisional play now you know or intra-divisional play now within your same division you still play your own division more than you play any other division and this is still the toughest division in baseball so that's not great i guess like when you look at the al east tampa well, they're the best team where i think we can agree on that at this point sure who do, who do you think the second best team is because i still would go with the jays You stumped me. Um, on paper, probably the Jays, yes. But the Jays haven't really played to their potential yeah. yet. Uh, and they really haven't had a, a span where they've been kind of firing on cylinders. So, like, t on paper, the Jays, but just on merit, like, on what's actually happened, I think the Orioles, honestly, uh, and the Yankees in that conversation ahead of the Jays as well. Like, right now, to this point, the Blue Jays have performed as the fifth best team in the AL East. Yes. Do you, do they, you agree with that? I mean, it's undeniable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they are at the bottom of the division. This is a podcast about a last place team right now. I mean, it's, it's the fact. Now, I, I don't think that that's going to change. Um, or, I mean, I do think that that's going to change. Uh, I do think the Jays are going to gain ground in the standings. I think that, you know, the Orioles, to me, yes, they have played as the second best team. And I think the Orioles are better than the Yankees right now. Um, you're right. Like last year, I thought they had a lot of growth to do um, still. Um, but now when I look at the Orioles, this is a good team. And I think the Yankees are getting old. I think that there are questions in the rotation with respect to you know the health of a Carlos Rodon, for instance, um, the health of a John Carlos Stanton, Josh Donaldson. Like, is he just kind of being pushed out of the way? Um, it's an old team, Aaron Hicks, DFA. Um, Baltimore's really good. Like, they have guys having really good career years, like a McKenna, like a Hayes. Rushman is unbelievable. Um, you know, Gunnar Henderson's underperformed to this point. They have the prospects in the system either to have, you know, whatever it is, a Jordan Westberg come up and impact them, or you can make trades if you're the Orioles. You can trade for whatever controllable young pitcher is maybe available, but maybe not available at the trade deadline. You think the Jays are going to get that with an injured Ricky Tiedemann at this point after already trading so much from their farm system to boost the team and already putting so many resources into the major league team? Like, I think the Orioles are better positioned to do that. And that's not to say that the Jays haven't shot their shot many times. It's not to say that the Jays haven't made meaningful acquisitions. But to me, when I look at this Blue Jays group, it, it kind of does have to come from within because... Of course, they're going to be in the market for trade deadline acquisitions. Of course, they're going to be out there trying to make moves. But I don't know. Like, I'm not holding my breath for a Shohei Otani coming to save the season. Well, and the Yankees are obviously going to be involved with the trade deadline in a major way as well. I mean, Brian Cashman has shown us that over time. And this is what we, when we talk about how well resourced the Yankees are, it's not just the payroll that they run, it's the ability to eat an Aaron Hicks contract right like it's the ability to make a mistake which is what that extension for Aaron Hicks was or what that deal for Aaron Hicks was whatever five years 70 whatever yep. whatever the the terms were there's probably like 30 million dollars left on that and Cashman's like yeah just write it off <laughs> you know just like shift it over to this side of the spreadsheet who cares about it for some organizations that would be crippling having to carry that I mean that would screw up your ability to acquire players and to build rosters going forward for the Yankees who might also do something similar with Josh Donaldson by the way 
it's just like it's they just write it off it's just a tax write off right so they uh, and they will go out at the deadline if they have to take on a bad contract they will right like they will have resources from within their system because they have a good minor league system as well to trade just like the Orioles will. I mean, like the fact that the Yankees have withstood not having a Rodon, not having a Montes, um, Severino just came back, yep. not having a Stanton for as long as they did and are still performing as well as they are. There's just some some absolute titans in this uh, in this division. So it's going to be very hard for the Blue Jays to win it. And, and should say too, like the Red Sox are not a bad team. You know, I watched Chris Sale pitch against the Padres on the weekend at some point. And like, man, does his delivery ever look good? And is his stuff ever alive? Like up to 98, sitting 95. Like, I don't know. That's like a really good scenario for the Red Sox to be in. So they're not to be forgotten either. But, you know, I guess the silver lining in this is, you know, crunching the numbers here a little bit. How many, what kind of pace do the Blue Jays have to play at? Presently 26 and 23 to win 90 games. Because 90 games, you're probably in the playoffs as a wild card team. And all they would have to do is play at a 92 win pace. Now, that's not easy. That's one of the better teams in the American League to play at that pace from this point on. But that's kind of in the range of where we thought the Blue Jays were. And so I think that's very doable for them. I will say, like, with how polarized the American League standings are looking, like with a historically bad Oakland Athletics team, with the Royals and the Tigers both being woeful, with the White Sox not looking very good, and maybe they tear down at the deadline and lose a whole bunch of games over the final two months, like that polarization, what that creates is a lot more really winning teams at the top because that's where like all those losses for the Royals and the athletics, like those are going somewhere. So like, could, couldn't you foresee like a future where it's say the Rays, let's give the Rays the AL East and uh, whoever wins the central twins, guardians, whatever, whoever comes in second, isn't going to be involved in the wild card. Uh, and then in the West, let's say it's, let's say it's the Rangers, whatever they're playing really well. In the West, you would still have the Astros, who are the friggin' Astros, yep. and who it's still fair to project, even though they haven't performed to their potential, it's still fair to project them over 90 wins, in my opinion. The Angels have two of the best players on the planet, and they're above 500 this year. Like, it wouldn't be out of the realm that they're a high 80s win team, even a 90 win team. The Mariners, right around 500, haven't performed to their potential, but they, they're like trying to win. Right now, they're making Luis Castillo type of moves right now. So maybe they make some more moves at the deadline and they get better. They could bump up into the high 80s, 90 win realm. And then you've got, because I gave the Rays the East, Yankees, Blue Jays, Orioles, all capable of being 90 win teams. Not all those teams can go to the playoffs, Ben. Yeah. Yankees, Blue Jays, Orioles, Astros, Angels. Like, not all those teams are going. So, yeah, the Blue Jays, like, they can, they have a path, obviously, to 90 wins. But if you really want to, like, feel safe about being a postseason team, you better be getting up to, like, 94, 95 this season, I think, just because of how bad some of the lousy teams in the AL are. And it's only fair to expect that some of those lousy teams are going to get lousier as the season continues. And, and here's the other thing with that. If you are not playing with any room for error for the final couple of weeks of the season, A, you're facing the Yankees and Rays a lot. So that, that your life is going to be pretty tough in that situation. And then B, you're using up your arms. You are really getting every last bit of juice out of your Jordan Romano, out of you know whoever you're trusting in your bullpen at that point. Um, and you're starting pitching. Kevin Gosman's going another 115 pitches to get you through the seventh inning. And then... Maybe you're playing a road game, two road games in, let's call it Houston. You know, that's tough. But the playoffs are tough. You know, this isn't, this is never meant to be easy. Um, and I do think that the Jays are in a position where, like, again, you look at the talent on this team. They got a healthy starting rotation. The bullpen's better than it's performed. The offense, I mean, we'll get into the offense a little bit more in a, in a more granular way as we move ahead here. But, like, it's still a good roster that's very capable of doing those things. Yeah, this can all sound kind of dour, right? And look, the fact is the Blue Jays need to perform better than they have to this point over the rest of the season. Like, like need to. It's not just a want. That is a need to. Otherwise, they're not going to go to the postseason. Uh, but the potential is clearly there. And they can look around and say, like, well, we haven't really gotten, like, 
primo George Springer yet. We haven't gotten primo Vladimir Guerrero Jr. yet, although we're doing that thing again with Vlad where it's like, he only has a 140 WRC plus. (laughs) Where's the other 15 points? Like, he's still like a top 20 hitter, but whatever, right? Like, the lineup still has not clicked offensively, and the bullpen has, you mentioned the bullpen being burned out towards the end of the year. You flirted with it being burned out a bit towards the beginning of the year as well, Uh, and the slug really hasn't shown up for this team as well. Like, some home runs would have papered over a lot of what they've gone through so i you you would think that a lot of those things will come back around and that the strength of this club which honestly to this point has been starting pitching ought to continue given health like that's the one thing i keep man i'm talking myself in circles here where i'm like yeah it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay and then i come back around to like (laughs) oh wait they've lost like the fewest man games to injury this year what happens if kevin gosman takes a comebacker and jose brios's shoulder starts barking like you got to consider that that's a possibility as well and that they're pretty close to like a zach thompson thomas hatch back end of the rotation as well oh man that uh, that's something to contemplate right Just there. But you're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And ideally, the Blue Jays would have built themselves up a cushion instead of putting pressure on. We need to get the most out of this roster. It would have been we can actually afford to lose a few games. So um, there's a lot to get to there uh, with the offense. When we come back on the other side of this break, we'll dive in in a bit more detail on the Blue Jays' offense and what we can expect from them as we move ahead. Welcome back to At The Letters, and it's time now to take a look at a Blue Jays offense that ranks 6th in the American League in runs scored, 8th in home runs, and, you know, Arden, this team has seemingly made a lot of little mistakes, some mental mistakes. We saw their manager make a mental mistake. All those things happened. None of those things are good. We're not here to make excuses for those things, but I just can't help but thinking If this team was hitting more home runs, then some of these errors, some of these mistakes would just seem less glaring because no team goes the whole season. No team goes a whole week without making mistakes. And sometimes it's the teams that hit enough home runs that can get by and can move on after making those mistakes. Yeah, it's not like the Blue Jays are getting blown out every night. They're losing by a run, two runs, maybe three. So, yeah, that's a three-run homer from being turned around. And all of a sudden, we're not talking about, uh, yeah, John Schneider forgetting how many mound visits there had been in an inning. We're not talking about Brandon Belt and Whit Merrifield running too aggressively from second to third on ground balls to the left side. We're not talking about Kevin Biggio oversliding the base. But you're right, these things do get magnified. And that's like that was part of what was going wrong for the Blue Jays over that week-long stretch seven eight nine days however many it was where like the losses were piling up it's like this perfect storm where the blue jays were um making those mental errors absolutely like playing like not clean unclean baseball um like that must be said they were not playing good enough they were not doing a good job at what they had set out to do coming into the season and that is being like a very um like a high attention to detail team a team that does little things really well they weren't doing that they were also having some of their like unluckiest, unclutchiest moments when you look at the runners in scoring position, when you look at some of the homers given up by really good relievers, like none of that was going their way. They were also amidst an incredibly challenging schedule stretch. Whatever the numbers are, they're playing like 17 straight and 30 and 31. And oh, by the way, it's just excellent competition after excellent competition. It's Braves, Yankees, Orioles, Rays. Uh, So you're playing teams that aren't going to make a ton of mistakes, teams that you can't beat cheaply, teams that punish mistakes. Uh, And then also you're like playing almost exclusively in your own divisions. So each loss is like maximum impact because someone else in your division moves up and you move down. So it was just like this perfect storm of things going on. I don't think that the Blue Jays are as bad as they showed over the last week. But I think, yeah, one more two run shot from George Springer, one more three run shot from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. would have made the last eight or nine days look a lot better than they do. I agree. I think that a lot of the time, those home runs can just buy you just a little bit more leeway that you need. And, you know, it's a team that ranks eighth in home runs, like I said. So 
um, after leading the American League in batting average and on base percentage and slugging percentage last year. They were an elite offensive team. They were a great offensive team in 2021, and they've been kind of middle of the pack so far this year offensively. I, I guess when it comes to those lapses, before we move on to the offense in a bit more detail here, do any of those lapses, like mentally, um, fundamentally, do any of those stick with you? Are, are any of those things cause for longer-term concern at all as the Jays move ahead? Honestly, no, because amidst that, you were seeing really good moments, right? You were seeing Kevin Kiermaier throw guys out at home plate. You were seeing Kevin Kiermaier throw somebody out at third base after a botched pickoff attempt. Yep. You've seen George Springer make really good plays in right field. You saw Bo Bichette make a couple of really heady plays. Um, I mean, you think about the two errors that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. had in the first game of the Tampa series. Like, this is a legitimate gold glover at yeah. first base. Like, this isn't like a paper tiger gold glover. This is a guy who earned that and who's played really good defense at first base. So, yeah, I, I don't think, even like the Schneider thing, like, that's like every manager like has moments like that. Like, I don't hold that against them so no there's none of that that I think going forward is really concerning yeah and the Schneider thing too like he admitted it afterwards um using some colorful language that I will not repeat but he acknowledged that he messed up and I would be really really surprised if it happens again um I just I, I would be I think the tactical side of the game is the strength of John Schneider's Don Mattingly did the exact same thing in LA like he had that exact same error happen to him. Like we see this, no, like nobody's perfect, right? Like managers make mistakes. It's just, it gets highlighted, magnified when you're not playing well. Like you look at the runners and scoring position stuff, right? And so I, like, I'm not even gonna look at the numbers right now because I'm sure that the two rounds of BP that the Blue Jays took at the end of their second game against the Rays have yeah. completely skewed everything. Uh, but for a while there, like they were, you know, among the bottom five teams in terms of production with runners and scoring position during that during that stretch. And yes, that's not what you want. Um, but when it comes to runners and scoring position, like the numerator tells you something and the denominator tells you something as well. Uh, over that time, the Blue Jays had like by far the most plate appearances with runners in scoring position over that stretch. They just weren't taking advantage of them. But I would argue the fact that the Blue Jays have the most plate appearances with runners in scoring position over that stretch is a good thing. Like, that tells you that the Blue Jays are putting themselves in those positions, that they're putting a lot of players on base, that they are not having quick one, two, three innings. Like, look back at prior seasons, high left on base totals, like, actually correlate pretty strongly to good, successful teams. If you're leaving a lot of runners on base, you're probably a really good team. Like, the most runners left on base in 2022, the teams that left the most runners on, you're looking at the Dodgers, the Padres, the Mets, like, really good offenses, really successful teams. So, there, it actually is, I think, a good thing. Uh, I think there is a, a really good silver lining in what was a really frustrating stretch of not seeing the production with runners in scoring position yeah you know who's not leaving a lot of runners on right now it's probably the Oakland A's haven't checked but I'm willing to bet that they haven't and it's kind of like you know in the NFL like red zone conversions right where like yeah like if you're getting down the field and you're getting into the other team's red zone well maybe you're not converting 100% of the time but you're doing some things right if you're putting that much pressure to the point that you're getting whatever it is a chance at the four yard line or a chance in the Blue Jays case with a couple runners on. Now, I, I do think that some of these hitters do bear a, a bit of a closer inspection. And you mentioned Vladdy in the first segment. As we record this right now, he has an 868 OPS, a 142 OPS plus, and that is with a, a month of May that has been below what you'd probably expect from Vladdy. But still, those numbers, maybe they're not quite MVP numbers, but they're, you know, they're great numbers offensively for Vladdy. Yeah, he's got like a 140 WRC plus, and we're like, what's wrong with him? Nothing. 
nothing's wrong with them. <laughs> Look, there's more potential for power there. Like, absolutely. I'm going to choose to believe that the homers are coming. Like, I under, I'm, I'm not reading anything into a small sample home road split at this point. Um, I, like, I just yeah. don't even, like, talk to me about the lack of home runs at the Rogers Center. It's like people saying, oh, the Rogers Center, it's a pitcher's park now. Uh, let's talk in 2027, because that's when we might actually have an idea of how the newly configured Rogers Center is playing. Try to read anything into the 20 games that have been played there. It's just fool's gold. It's folly. Uh what I will read into is the fact that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is still like top 20 in barrels, barrels per plate appearance, like hard hit balls, max exit velocity, average exit velocity, all this stuff. The guy hits the ball extremely hard in a very uncommon way at the highest level against the highest level of competition in the world. I believe that the home run numbers are coming. Like, I believe the extra base hits are coming if he's going to continue striking the ball as hard as he is. I have a lot of faith in that process. A hundred percent. And I think, like, honestly, like, how many players really would you have confidence in saying they're going to be better than Vlad Jr. from this point on in the season? You know, like, okay, Trout, um, Judge. Jordan Alvarez, Judge. Um, maybe Mookie Betts, just with the consistency. Acuna. Um, yeah, like those players are probably better bets to perform better than Vladdy. <laughs> and then you run out of names pretty fast, right? <laughs> like it's Vlad Jr. If you told me, hey, fast forward to the end of September, Vlad Jr. Uh, was the best hitter in baseball from May 24th on, I'd be like, okay, what else yeah. happened? You know, like it, it just wouldn't be surprising he's that good of a hitter. Top five max exit velocity, top five average exit velocity, the most balls hit 95 miles per hour or harder this year, top 19 in barrels per plate appearance. Like all this stuff is going to lead to good outcomes over time, I promise you. Look, the thing with Vladdy over the last 10 days that like I've seen, and this is just more anecdotal, I haven't like done a deep dive on this it's just like some of the swing decisions haven't been great um and vladdy's a guy who like in the past has admitted to pressing and trying to you know kind of be the hero and do a little bit too much when maybe it just makes more sense to pass the baton and have that good plate appearance it's really hard to do when you're 24 years old and there's a ton of expectations on you and you're hitting third in a lineup that's expected to do more than it has to this point so i i have seen him a little in between again just like i test in between in terms of chasing the pitch that he should take and then either taking the pitch that he should demolish or just getting too big in his swing and getting too out ahead and either swinging through it or hitting a million mile an hour foul ball to the left side but that's like that's just particular to this more recent stretch and we know the ability to make really strong swing decisions and to work a really competent approach is in there and like you said i expect him to be really good over the next four months there was even an example of that early in the Tuesday game facing Taj Bradley where he was just a little, seemingly a little geared up to hit. And that's understandable when you got the bat speed that Vladdy has. And, and I think, you know, you've got hitters like a Trout or a Judge who just have a consistency to their discipline and to their swing decisions that, you know, they're the elite of the elite. Vlad Jr. has been there, can get there, maybe not presently, um, but still, you know, a great hitter. So... He's he's going to be fine. Um, that has the ATL seal of approval for for Vlad Jr. <laughs> um, and then you know it leads us to George Springer because you know Springer has at this point, and, and this is after a really really good game on Tuesday in which he homered, um, had I think four hits against Tampa Bay. His season numbers right now: seven twelve OPS. That is a one hundred OPS plus, exactly league average, and seven home runs. So, what do you make of Springer and where he's at offensively? He's just a streaky guy. I think that's what we've kind of learned about him over his time in Toronto. Um, and we, like, honestly, I don't know, 98% of hitters are streaky is the thing, right? Like, everybody, it's very rare that you, very seldom you find that hitter who's just pole to pole. Um, amazing. Usually you have your hot streaks and you have your cold ones. It all kind of averages out over time. So I honestly don't even think we've seen, like, the the real hot streak yet from George Springer. Maybe it's coming. You're seeing like a lot better results on balls in play lately. There was a, a phase much earlier this year in April where he was getting really unlucky on balls in play and some balls that he was cr crushing were just to the wrong part of the ballpark or right at somebody. And then he went through 
honestly like a phase where the contact wasn't that great and the ball wasn't coming off his bat that hard um and he looked not himself at the plate and he was battling like a really severe virus at that yeah. point as well which was holding them out of games at times and having him playing in games at other times when people around the club were like i don't know how this guy's playing right now and now i think he's just getting back to himself is he gonna be like the prime george springer like last couple years in houston george springer no but he's also like we must admit at the point in his career where it's like 33 34 35 he's probably gonna the the statistics are gonna start degrading a little bit for him but a degraded george springer from his prime is still a really above average player so yeah i think that you know like when you talk about vlad you talk about springer like these are the two guys who really power the blue jays offense and who really carry things for them them. and um i i think that george springer is going to be a lot better going forward than he's been in the past so that makes me think that the blue jays offense is going to perform a lot better going forward as well yeah i, I would i would tend to agree with that i think that um it's got to be a relief for the jays to see springer bounce back offensively um even if there are reasons for it even if every player is entitled to a slump in a season where you're batting 600 times like they're not all going to be great plate appearances um when you hit that often so I think that makes sense. But at the same time, with Springer, it kind of reminds me of Jose Barrios on the pitching side where it's like, okay, maybe they're not performing at elite, elite, elite best case scenarios, but you're paying them a lot for a long time. And to have them be good, to have them be really productive players, if nothing else, and Barrios has certainly gotten to that point, um, then you've got something. I mean, that's, that's an important part of a very good baseball team to have those veteran guys producing at a level that's very good um, or good to very good. That's, that gives you something. Yeah. I just think Springer just hasn't necessarily been punishing his mistakes or at least maybe hasn't been like, he's been hitting them hard at times, just hasn't seen the results for them to this point. Like when it came to Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Like it's, it's pretty clear he's seen a lot more breaking balls this year than fastballs right and that would make a lot of sense because Vladdy mashes fastballs and is one of the best fastball hitters in baseball this year so clearly there is like a, an adjustment that's been made to him and he has to adjust back to that but I, I think George Springer's kind of been pitched pretty similar this year to ways that he has in the past I think he just hasn't had the results on the mistakes that he gets to which by the way like that's what that's what every hitter is doing is just trying to crush mistakes just trying to lay off the pitcher's pitch lay off the thing on the edge if you have to go 0-1 so be it we talk about this with Dalton Varsho all the time he's got that hole at the top of his swing up in the zone up and in particularly but really anything up he's got to just take those pitches like even if he falls behind 0-2 we talked about this a couple weeks ago like if if you're facing like a Jacob deGrom level dude who can locate up and in consistently three times all right tip the cap walk back to the dugout you struck me out cool but you're not facing Jacob deGrom every night and you're facing pitchers who make mistakes most nights. So you got to take that pitcher's pitch and then hammer the mistake when you get it. You see Dalton Varsha do that when he's hitting these like 450 foot home runs. He's not doing it against the pitch up and in. He's doing it against the mistake from the pitcher trying to get up and in so that this is a roundabout way of me saying like i think george springer's making good swing decisions and i think he's being pitched the same way i just don't think he's seen the results on mistakes that, that he has in the past yeah and and that can even out pretty quickly as we're seeing with that that game against tampa just quickly on varsho because you mentioned him i was looking a little bit uh, at the numbers like strikeout rate barrel rate walk rate and it seems pretty consistent to where he was last year so just a quick note to anyone worried about dalton varsho that those behind the scenes numbers look pretty encouraging. It doesn't mean that he's going to be, um, you know, the best hitter in baseball, but it looks like he can get back to being a solid to above average hitter, um, which of course is huge for the Jays. Um, I also want to touch on Brandon Belt. And, you know, early in the season, as, as ATL listeners know, I was kind of down on Brandon Belt and his performance with the Jays. And then got to give him credit where it's due. Okay. So, May. OPS 1033 over a thousand. He's been great. He's been making some good contact. He's been honestly like one of the better hitters in their lineup. So full credit to Brandon Belt, whose season numbers now look very good. And yet, Arden, I have to rain on this parade a little bit. I just have to because, you know, I'm looking at just some of the BABIP, and that's batting average and balls in play, as I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar with. League average for BABIP is like 290, 295, depending on the year. 
Um, Brandon Belt, this season among players with at least 100 plate appearances, he is number one in baseball, and that is a 450, can't read my own writing, 456 batting average on balls in play this season. And in May, when he's been really good, his batting average on balls in play is 643. No one posts a 643 BABIP, especially not players who are relatively slow when it comes to foot speed. So I'm not trying to I'm not trying to like take this away from Brandon Belt, but I just can't help but point out that there has been some good fortune. And he's had a good approach. Again, that's good. He's made some good contact, but I'm not sure that he's the thousand OPS guy either, because I think some regression is coming. He's not as bad as he looked in April, and he's not as good as he looks in May. Like, it's somewhere in between. Like, that's, that's pretty clear. I've taken the Fangraphs leaderboards for May, and I've set the minimum plate appearances to 40 for the month, which seems fair. It's May 24th. Like, we're getting towards the end. So, like, 40 plate appearances, I think, is totally reasonable. Belt's got 62, so I'm including a bunch of guys I don't have to include in this sample. He has the 11th highest weighted runs created plus in baseball in the month of May. Yeah. So I'd like a full marks to Brandon Belt for what he's done. 0.7 F war this month, Ben. This is a guy making nine and a half million dollars. Like he's almost like giving you his what you're paying him this month. Pretty yep. nearly. <laughs> so but his season long F war is probably gonna be yeah, it's point four, right? Because he was below replacement level in April. So he's like kind of he's gotten himself back above water, but I think that if Brandon Belt just kind of settles in to not the 200 WRC plus guy, not the whatever it was in April 40, just into like a 110 WRC plus guy, he's going to be providing you surplus value on for what you were paying him by August. And so for the Blue Jays to be, that's a win. Because you didn't bring Brandon Belt here to carry your lineup. You didn't bring him here to be like the guy we were saying that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and George Springer need to be the guy that Matt Chapman and Bo Bichette have been. But I think that like you will be getting the value that you're looking for out of Brandon Belt over the course of the season if he just settles back somewhere in the middle of these two extremes that we've seen from him. It's a reminder that like things change quickly in baseball at the end of April, like you said, talking about Matt Chapman as an MVP candidate, Brandon Belt is like a DFA candidate. Here we are getting towards the end of May and it's Matt Chapman's been like playing at a best in baseball or producing, I should say offensively at a best in baseball rate over the month of May. And Matt Chapman's been in a slump all month. So things change really quickly in this sport and we are such prisoners of the moment where we can only really analyze what's happened over small samples at this point in the season. But I do think belt is a good bet to finish the year somewhere around that 108 to 110 WRC plus with like 1.2 wins above replacement, maybe 1.4. And I think the blue Jays are fine with that real quick before we step away for another moment here. If you could lock, if you're the blue Jays and you could lock in, let's say 300 plate appearances from Brandon belt, at a 105 OPS plus for for the rest of the season. Would you lock that in or would you roll the dice? Without thinking about it. You would lock it in. In a heartbeat, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely. (laughs) Just the playing time, honestly. The fact that he's, at that point, not avoiding the IL. (laughs) (laughs) There's no knee inflammation issue, right? Like, at that point, for sure. What about a 100 OPS plus? I might roll the dice there because I think he's capable of more than that. I think I would lock it in. But uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we do not have that kind of power. So instead, we'll step away. And when we come back, we will talk a little bit behind the scenes and we'll touch on the Blue Jays bullpen. Welcome back to At The Letters. Ben Nicholson-Smith here with Arden Zwelling. As we discuss uh, the Blue Jays, and let's go behind the scenes a little bit here, Arden, and use the roster moves the Jays made this week against the Rays for a little insight into what actually happens when roster moves are made. Because a lot of the time, you know, you see a tweet. Um, In our case, we're getting press releases from the team. Sometimes we see these things unfolding in real time behind the scenes. But for instance, Ernie Clement selected to the Blue Jays roster. Otto Lopez optioned. Mitch White transferred to the 60-day IL. Meanwhile, Adam Simber activated. Thomas Hatch optioned. These are five players. These are five human beings whose lives are sort of in the balance here. Um, And there's a lot of logistics involved. So 
I guess I'll just pose it to you in a big picture way. <laughs> like what actually happens well, I would when teams are just making like these throw it back to you, honestly, because I know you want to get into kind of the, the nitty gritty of it uh, a little bit more, but it, it, the process honestly begins well before any of these announcements ever, ever come along. Well, exactly. And I think that, you know, it's probably fair to say the process begins after the previous game. You know, after the previous game ends, a lot of the time, that's when these decisions are made, usually in the manager's office, often with it's a general manager, maybe an assistant general manager, whatever it is, director of pro personnel, pick your title. That front office person will be in there with the manager and some coaches, and they'll talk over a move for what they might need to do for the next day. Now, oftentimes that involves <clears throat> physically getting someone from one city to another city. Um, so that means you're involving your director of team travel. You're making sure that the player that you want to pick can join you physically in the city that you're playing in the next day. So they need to know that they need to get their bags packed. That involves players with the minor league team. A lot of the time, sometimes like with Adam Simber and the blue Jays, that player is already with you. So the logistics are pretty simple, but other times like with Ernie Clement, you've got to involve the minor league team. You've got to make sure the player is. Um, uh, aware of this, obviously, so that they can get there. Sometimes an agent might be involved um, to help coordinate those things. And you're probably not going to officially announce that move until the player you're hoping to activate is physically with the team. Because otherwise, what's the point? You're trying to improve your team. Um, and so you need to, yeah, get that player there physically. And sometimes that can involve a flight. Sometimes it's a, a what, car what would service. you call it? Like a town car? Like a, yeah, car service. Um, or, you know, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, different means. Those would be the common ones, obviously, a flight or a car service. Then you get the player there and then boom, activate, send out the press release. Yeah, and and you and I are can tweeting. be really unideal for those edge of the roster players who are kind of up and down. And even the guys who sometimes get called up to be on a taxi squad because you might IL somebody, like you might make a move and then they you know say they they pitch the night before and they get the call at one in the morning and they're on a flight at six and they haven't slept and you're not on a charter at that point you're flying commercial which comes with all kinds of hurdles and things and then you get on the ground and you got to get to the ballpark and you got all your stuff with you you don't even know if you're going to be activated or not you got to prepare like you might need to be in this game um on that given night i remember matt gage went through that a few times last year and talking to him about some of the challenges ask trent thornton <laughs> about that he's had some like really tough up and downs um the thing like the thing that we don't talk about enough is just the impact on a player's family honestly uh um, the impact on the spouse and on the children and just kind of living this like nomadic life where you don't really know where you're gonna be um half the time and where you are physically in time and space as you said is actually kind of up to somebody else a lot of the time and can be really unpredictable in nature it makes it tough to like make plans with your family or to do things at your kid's school or to you know be there to help your spouse with things around the house with things with you know raising your children with whatever and like baseball players are human beings too their kids get sick and their kids have issues at school and like their spouses have lives and problems and issues and things that they have to deal with they have family members who have health problems and you know people who are going through things that they would like to be there to support them with and so much of that ends up being done remotely uh if at all if you're even capable of it just because of this life of being a professional ball player and i get it like they that's what they sign up for and they're well compensated nobody's denying any of that but i do think we don't do a good enough job a lot of the time of just expressing how difficult how challenging how arduous that can be for the the human beings who you see in uniform every night oh for sure and then it's like after you go through that and you're like sending text you know whatever the case to a significant other or you know you finally get your stuff packed and there's a flight delay and you get to the ballpark and then it's like usually you're maybe the last guy in the bullpen at that point and you're pitching mop-up duty on like four hours sleep so you know there are real challenges to that um before you get to the point that some you know there's a locker in the clubhouse for you a clubhouse attendant has set it up 
as you said, this is a big league lifestyle once they get here. But even just getting to that point of arriving there, someone else's locker has been cleaned out. You've got a new one set up. Your name is printed up. Um, above the stall, you've got a big league jersey there, but it takes a lot to and get to that, that point end sometimes. And you're that end of reliever. Now you're in a game and you're facing the best hitters in the world who aren't taking it lightly on you, as has been a bit of a theme recently on at the letters. And you're tired and fatigued, and maybe you pitched the night before and you didn't sleep, and like, oh, I just missed my location, and uh, Jordan Alvarez just took me deep for a three run shot, and I will never get the opportunity to like lower this ERA as. As a reliever for what I have just given up, and that's going to be on my fan graphs or baseball reference page for the rest of time. And people who are looking at me on you know the internet and trying to say whether I'm a good or bad pitcher will say, This guy stinks. Look at his major league ERA, the one he got to the big leagues, and you saw that he's not good enough when you really weren't in the best uh, position possible to be successful. It's tough, man. It's a tough life for sure. For sure. And as long as we're talking about relievers and ERAs and home runs allowed, let's uh, talk about the Blue Chase bullpen here a little bit um, because it's been a weird stretch for them uh, and not a weird stretch in a good way. Uh, the relievers have really struggled a lot. of. We've seen Jimmy Garcia. We've seen Jordan Romano struggle. Um, where do the Blue Jays turn at this point? Like when they have <laughs> less than a 19 run lead and they're looking to lock it down <laughs> you know like who do you think they can turn to it's, who are the see, most you trusted basically guys got for you three right and now. a half right now if you're the blue jays jordan romano eric swanson jimmy garcia and tim Aza versus lefties so that's your half right there right um and i know yeah. jimmy garcia got blown up the other night but he was pitching his fourth day his fourth time in six days uh, and like his sixth and nine or something like look it up the guy was being used like just pushed to his limits and he was still out there throwing 96 97 uh the issue is it wasn't located as finely as it needs to be and yeah that's going to happen when you're pitching for the fourth time in six days like you can't these guys like you can't just use them at will like you have to give them time to recover in between their outings and the blue jays have been overusing that back end of their bullpen, honestly, like this is normalized a little bit over the last uh, couple of days. Um, you know, it was really th tough in that last game against the Orioles when Jimmy Garcia gave up a bunch of hits, like after being overused at that point, you had guys like Swanson Garcia who were like on pace over 162 to appear over 80 times which is not sustainable, which is not going to happen. At that point, guys like Mays and Romano were like mid-70s, the pace in terms of appearances for the season. That's just not going to happen. And the Blue Jays have normalized that a little bit over the last couple of days. But even still, as we sit here, Wednesday, May 24th, Eric Swanson, Jimmy Garcia, on pace, both of them, for 76 appearances. Tim Meza on pace for 69 and wow. Jordan Romano on pace for 66. Blue Jays need to lighten that load on the back end of their bullpen. They need to find somebody else that they can trust in leverage because John Schneider just doesn't have enough options right now. That's an interesting point about the pace. I hadn't looked at that. And yeah, 76, you, you can't do that. Yeah, and it's not to say that it's not to say that it should have been managed differently to this point. They're trying to win games. You can do that for maybe a couple months, but you have to ease in the middle months of the season because again, in October, they're not going to be going to the sixth or seventh reliever in the bullpen. It's going to be your your most important guys who are absorbing the highest stress, highest. Well, the Jays have perpetually been in leverage. Time. Like we've been talking about this, the Jays are just doing the same thing they did last year all over again. They're playing nothing but leverage, nothing but tight games. They're struggling with runners in scoring position. Just like replay the ATL from last May, and we talking about the same stuff. But this is why, like that the lack of power that we were talking about earlier matters because that would also paper over some of this bullpen stuff. If you were getting more homers, you would have less one and two run leads to try to protect. You would have 
four or five run leads. And now all of a sudden it's Trevor Richards and it's Adam Simber and it's easing Anthony Bass back into leverage after you had to remove him from it earlier this year. It's, it's Nate Pearson who I think has earned more leverage opportunities. Um, and, and Bass is on that track as well. Like I think that from within the Blue Jays are going to have to find somebody from that tier of like Pearson Bass, Zach Pop when he's healthy, who they can throw in to leverage in addition to adding at the trade deadline and not only adding Chad Green, but like going out and trading for this year's Anthony Bass, who can come in and actually like face meaningful leverage for you down the stretch. Yeah, because, you know, Chad Green, who alongside Hyunjin Ryu was throwing a bullpen in uh, St. Petersburg this week with the Jays. You know, a good case scenario for Chad Green, and it's all very much a moving target. None of this is fixed in stone, of course, but a good case for Chad Green might be like, I don't know, August 15th. It's 12 to 15 months. They had their surgeries in June. So right now these guys are at 11 months. And so, yeah, like I think mid-August or something along those lines would be good for Green. I think with Ryu, if the Jays get anything, that's probably good. I, I I think the Jays probably can't be holding their breath that Ryu is going to come back and just he might be just the that, most that expensive perfect shot sixth the starter in baseball, <laughs> right? Like that would probably be a pretty good outcome if it's like yeah. we're inserting him to make a spot start be. here and there and get Kevin Gosman that extra rest, back off Chris Bassett's innings a little bit. Some of these veteran guys as we head towards the postseason. When it comes to Green, when it comes to Gr- that would be yeah, absolutely. That would when be it, when it comes to Green, you. like. Not only like what will the effectiveness be there coming off of Tommy John, who knows, but you're going to have to manage his workload really carefully as well because he's coming off of Tommy John, like very major surgery, very long term rehabilitation. Like you're not going to be pitching him on back to backs right away. Certainly not three days in a row. But you think about what you have to ask of relievers down the stretch. You need back to backs from your best arms. You need Jordan Romano getting four and five outs, which by the way is something that has been happening way too often early in the season with a really important reliever. Like we've seen Romano have stretches in recent years where like the velocity goes down, all of a sudden he doesn't appear in a game for ten days, right? They don't IL him, but they definitely back off his usage mid season at times. Maybe you see that again. Uh, if you're going to keep asking the guy to come in with one and two outs in the eighth inning in these really high pressure spots, like you want to save some bullets because you believe that you are a postseason team. I believe the Blue Jays are a postseason team. You're going to need these guys to be like logging heavy workloads late in September in in October when they are on fumes. So you want to really carefully manage things now. It's why the Blue Jays just need more options late in games. It's why Anthony Bass was like a great addition last year because not only was he like a top 10 guy uh, as relievers in ERA and FIP, but he just pitched a ton last year. Like Anthony Bass threw like over 70 innings last year, over 70 appearances, uh, and the Blue Jays used him liberally down the stretch. Like, And he was able to answer that bell. I think they need to try and identify someone else who they can uh, acquire at the deadline who can do something similar this year. I think you want more additions. I think you want some of those internal guys to step up. And yet, you know, when I look at this bullpen, I think it's a pretty good group. And I know, you know, I'm saying that in the face of a pretty bad week, but I, I honestly think it's a pretty good bullpen. And no bullpen's perfect. Obviously, you're going to look to add, but like, I think the ingredients. Yeah, I think with a bullpen, you just want to, like, it's a volume game. Just get as many promising guys as possible and kind of see who's going to yep. hit down the stretch, right? Like, just give yourself as many opportunities to find those good stories because, like, with relievers, there is so much volatility. Right. And there's just like so much up and down. Health is never certain. Um, So I I think that like you just want to acquire as many good arms as possible and then get to September and see like hopefully you've got two, three, four, five of them who are healthy and performing well and who you trust in really stressful, pressureful moments. Relievers don't do that very well, but that always helps as well. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> maybe the other guys can help them out with that um all right that is going to be it for us this week on at the letters thanks to Arden Welling for the insight as always thanks to christian ryan and nick andrade for producing and thanks to you for listening we really appreciate you coming along with us and hitting play on atl when it pops up wherever you find your podcasts we will talk to you next week and until then thanks for listening